Uh, hi, my name is Jared. I'm from Australia. I just want to firstly thank you um, for doing everything that you do and, of course, to coming to Israel to speak to us uh, exclusively about the Zeitgeist Movement and everything else. I've been following the Zeitgeist Movement since the middle of 2011 and since I uh, first came across the Zeitgeist documentary series. It's completely changed my life for the better. And um, again, thank you so much. My question is uh, when, if, if you are or not, whether you're uh, pondering a visit to Australia um, before the release of the film. Is this working? Test? Test, test, test. Test? I'll, I'll use this. Did you want to translate what he yeah, asked? Uh, Test, 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 test. Uh, Australia, I, I would love to come to Australia. I was supposed to go two years ago and something happened and I couldn't make it. There was some organizers there in the movement. I, I have no intention to, but anything could happen. But uh, that's all I can, that's, that's it, I have no idea. <laughs> I'm gonna be very busy working on the film though, uh, so it's gonna be probably difficult for me to do much traveling. But if the movement there was able to arrange something that made like a larger event, that, that would be interesting to get going just as, as everyone did here. You know, as opposed to just say like a film screening or something like that, I'd, I'd be I'd be certainly intrigued, intrigued to do that okay. since I've never been. So maybe you guys can arrange something. Contact me. Okay. okay. Thank you very much. Sure. Thank you. I don't think I'm going to answer this question because it's a question about when Peter is going to come to Australia. So we'll see. Hi. Hi. In your second movie, you presented uh, the Venus Project as uh, the solution to all the uh, issues and problems that you presented here. And uh, I wanted to, I want you to speak about uh, the split, and why did you stop being the activist arm of the Venus Project? Well, actually, we never stopped being the activist arm of the Venus Project. The Venus Project made a decision that their direction wasn't being represented. And as far as out of the solutions you speak of, the Venus Project is a representation of a body of ideas that present solutions that existed prior. So if you really think about what we're doing here, we're talking about a train of thought. A train of thought is irrespective of any institution. It has to do with logic and reason. A grave failure that was made early on in my work here was to relegate all association of solution to one man and to one institution. I regret having done that because it actually did a disservice to, to the community as a whole because it did not let them think. It didn't let them understand what it means to apply science to actually to take a critical view. And I'm not putting down any institution, by the way, or anyone that works at the Venus Project. Absolutely not. But it's not about an institution. So I did nothing to, to become not the activist arm. That was their decision. I d all I did was promote the train of thought and that's what I continue to do. Thank you. Thank you. Um, 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 Hi. Um, what I would like to know is you spoke in the last part, it was relatively short, and the first three parts were more analyzing the past. I'm more interested in how the future uh, can look. So, in that regard, you said that if uh, change will come, it will come from the 99% from the citizens, not from uh, the people who are controlling. Right. So, what I want to know is, how would this change manifest, in your opinion? And how would we prevent a situation where, again, 1% would rise and take control of it? How would this intrinsically be different to prevent that from happening? Have you seen other talks I've given? Have you seen other, other things that I've done? I've seen the movies only. OK, one thing that I wanted to do with this, because the subject was different, well, basically, since the subject was different, I didn't want to go through the entire expanse of things I've talked about before in, in other lectures, especially that were in like the films, which is why I ended it in that way, because I can't possibly spend that much time. It'd be another hour of me discussing such issues. That being said, the solution, you know, there, there is a very powerful train of thought that can compose the solution. The transition to that solution, again, that's 
for a larger conversation, what it means to apply what we understand to social origination and to human affairs. The transition to anything new is going to be very complicated and very tense because as history has shown, any move to any new social idea in the broader, the more, the more, the more it's fought, uh, is met with a great deal of, um, of both public and establishment, uh, how do I put it nicely, uh, offense, I suppose. So while you know, the 99%, for, forget that language. I use that just because it's being popularized right now. But the people coming together because their betterment is at stake, because they're literally at risk on, on multiple levels from the problems of war I and mean, all the things I could list, the environmental problems, the extreme in inequality and equity, there's, it's going to motivate people in some way. And I consider this system failing. I think it's going to continue to fail from a few different angles. And hopefully that pressure will get people to want to educate themselves. And that education, when you think about a social system, if, <laughs> if properly referenced, always gravi gravitates back, or it should gravitate back to the basic principles of what the Zeitgeist Movement advocates as far as a new social system. How to get there, everyone loves to ask me that. And I'm sorry to say I can't give you a straight answer because it's, it's, very, it's very difficult. I could ramble on for probably 20 minutes about ideas, but I don't want to waste everybody's time. One thing that I'm trying to put forward, which I hope will to start within, I don't know, hopefully by mid this year, if not towards the end, is something called the Global Redesign Institute. And what it is is a, is a is an interface that, in a public sense, everyone can interact with. It's digital, it's online, and it's an overlay system where people can redesign society in a very physical way. It's like a virtual way of redesigning the infrastructure or redesigning the uh, energy resources and allocations. You take known principles and you, of engineering and you apply them, and you create, for lack of a better expression, a Wikipedia type of affair where everyone is contributing, sourcing, and making this model virtually. And as the inefficiencies of this system grow, I think people are going to be desperate to know what they, what, what's next, what they can do to make their lives better, especially countries that are really suffering with heavy unemployment, with heavy energy prices. And someone might show them, this is a blueprint for your region, it's the global redesign. And they might say, this is amazing. We, don't, we need money, and now we do it, but if we didn't have money, we could just do it. And I think that logic of just doing it will eventually prevail and you'll eventually, hopefully, have some country or some subset of, of, of a country that's willing to dedicate their resources and labor to make the first stages of what an efficient society may be. And then from there, it catches on. And all the establishments, slowly, they, they lose their power because they don't work and people see a new alternative. They don't want to submit to the nonsense that they've been doing you know, for the past 2,000, 3,000, 4,000 years. They see it, they finally see it, you know, and it's hard. It's hard to, to say when that could happen or how, but I will just reiterate that the failures of the system will be catalytic, will be catalytic. <laughs> so, does that help? Yeah, that I wish helps. I could give you a more straightforward answer, but that it's, helps. It, it's I, very complicated. It's all about awareness, so if there's anything I encourage anybody to do, it's, it's not only spread this information, but also think creatively, too. Think about what you would do if you had, the, like, I'm, like in my film, um, Project Earth, the third section, it's all about thinking about what, if you, had a, if you had a planet, how would you construct it? What would the logical basis of a new planetary system be? Mm -hmm. And you begin to work from that core logical level, and then it starts to self-form if you think about it's the scientific basis of our existence. Yeah, thank so you very much. Sure, thank you. Hey, good evening. Hi. Um, so with the economic, um, social, ecologic paradigm, the way it is today, it almost seems I, I've watched, <clears throat> I've watched all your movies, I've, uh, you know, I really enjoyed this lecture. Thanks. Um, but it almost seems utopic to a point of how am I myself, when I need to go earn my living, I want to open my own business to provide for myself if I specifically being in Israel, being Israeli Jews, feeling all this, we may call it anti-Semitism or whatever it may be towards us, it almost feels like all these ideas are almost utopic and not really tangible in the real world. Mm. And this is my question. On a personal note, since I've been aware of most of these things, it's just really, really, really depressing. Right. It's just, it's like, 
why would I want to put my money in the bank? Why would I want to you know, buy clothes? Why would I want to do anything? Because we're heading towards the end of it all. So my question would be on a day-to-day -day way of living. What is it that you think that we could each do, besides awareness, besides coming to this, that we could do to bring the change? That, that's another great question I get asked a lot. And, and I could probably give you some very overly simplified answers regarding where you would put your energy into, like what fields you work in. For example, I would recommend if, you have, if you're young enough and you're still dealing with the early educational stages, don't go into advertising or things that I had to do, I fell into. Uh, go into something that actually does something tangible, first of all. Go into programming or structural engineering or something that has a direct return to society that literally produces something. Uh, beyond that, you know, it, it becomes, because what we speak of is such a broad view, it's inherently broad, for me to give you solutions within the system is almost counterproductive. Mm. Like, what, what, like, could you give me an example of what you think you could do off the top of your head, uh, given the context of what we speak of? Well, the problem is that I feel I find myself looking for these answers, but I always, like you said, find myself falling back into... As an individual, there's really not that much you can do. It's, it's when the power comes together in certain ways that has some type of larger effect on the social system. For example, you could have a hybrid system emerge eventually where you have certain attributes of what you, you call the resource-based economy or resource-based economic model. Certain attributes are there that are, are using maximized technological efficiency to better the world's people still within, within the market system to a certain degree. And that's a great hope. Where, it's, where countries that have mass poverty, they finally stop relying on the United Nations and World Bank loans, and they start to build their own technological structures that are very advanced, like you know, with vertical farmings, for example, and they just do it themselves, and they feed. They don't, they don't engage in commerce. They just feed everybody <laughs> with the technical means. It could be done, and I, I'd love to see a country finally wake up to do that, um, but unfortunately, it just, it's without the paradigm of thought. Those things are great if you think about it, if they could happen. That would be amazing. If even in Israel, if I, I don't think your unemployment's not that bad. I'm not sure if your, pro your poverty doesn't seem to be that bad either. Or, uh, is it? I'm not quite sure. Five percent. Five percent. So as a well, as opposed to uh, of course Palestine and Gaza, which have and five. That's what I read. Nikhan, karate. I read it was five percent. Don't kill. No. Okay. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Let's assume, for example, no. that all of the. Let's okay. let's assume, for example, that all of the um, the current state of affairs. Well, let's take Africa as a great point. Africa has been systematically abused for, for uh, a good 150 years by imperial powers, and it it's what has one of the most resource-rich landmass. It's one of the most resource-rich rich land masses in the world, yet it's one of the poorest. It, it should be the mo it should be the wealthiest, considering what it has. If somebody was able to get enough ingenuity together and get enough support to build initial structures that would provide for the people, it would be absolutely incredible to see the chain reaction that would emerge with other states. Does, I'm sorry, does that not bring us back to governments controlling people? It somehow, regardless of whether you call it government as we know it today or a new form of government, it has to come from some type of larger order construction. And as much as people are afraid of government, as much as people are, are terrified of, I mean, obviously, I'm not a fan of the state, but the state doesn't have to be the way it is. It's, a pr it's the way the state is materialized within the market economy that has formed the extreme biases and propensities that the state has. Doesn't mean that you, you shouldn't have a total view. Doesn't mean that you shouldn't have consideration of the largest order entity. Doesn't mean the world a, as a whole shouldn't have people literally thinking about how it's working, technically. Yeah. Not the control of people, but the control of how to take care of the people in an appropriate scientific way. And unf again, unfortunately, this is a, a tangent, obviously, but uh, unfortunately, all the values are against that because social stability is antithesis of the market economy. It's antithesis of the state institution. It doesn't benefit to have steady state economies or to have peace. So that aside, you know, th there's so many things moving against what we, what we talk about that I always come back to the same thing, global mass movement. Global mass movement with a massive pressure that emerges where the, the powers that be step back and realize that they're losing broad control. And they can no longer even depend on each other to, to requalify themselves in their state identification. I understand. Thank you very much. Sure, thank you. Hi. Uh, Hi. First of all, I would like to thank you, another person that thanks you.
personally for a change that you did in my life and the movies you, you created and obviously all the things that followed. Uh, it really meant a lot to me, so thank you. Thank you. And, uh, and uh, the second thing is um, I heard you uh, mention or say a couple of times, I'm not sure exactly what you meant, but I think it was on the Joe Rogan show okay. that you <coughs> talked about communes and you don't support the uh, um, establishment of uh, scientific I mean, communes mm. under the values that you speak, of, uh, speak about. Well, no, not exactly. I think in the context, which is a, con which is a common one, I don't see it as a solution in and of <laughs> itself. And I see it possibly as semi-dangerous, especially if you were to get a, a commune of sorts that really was doing well while the, the remaining region started to suffer. If the commune wasn't willing to open its doors entirely and to continue to expand and absorb everybody, you'd probably end up with violence. You'd probably end up with combatant type of environments and considering that everything is based on scarcity in the system so if you do have a commune such as such as the kibbutz for example which is similar in that in that sort of vein you know that that's isolated but still it's still supported by money but even though internally it doesn't have those mechanisms of trade as as ever, as, as, we, as absurd as we see of course in, in the general world but is that a solution does that present I mean, is it, if you want to have a high-tech commune first of all you even have to have an enormous amount of money but we're talking using the mar in, in the market system, the type of technology that would facilitate uh, the things that we speak of in the movement, in the market system, they would be e extraordinarily expensive. Doesn't mean they're really expensive. <laughs> it means that all the, the processes that go through investment, the culmination, the restructuring of industry, the usage of land, property, all I'm the talking about if, if people uh, with skills, I mean, like engineers, like Jacques Fresco, and people like that, uh, botanists, and and uh, I know people with uh, technological skills would like get together and start communes that could support. If they had the money to do it, that could uh, obviously, oh, back to the Venus Project, a great concept, which is really what builds the logic out as far as things catching on. Jock Fresco always talked about having circular city systems that, would, that in one country would pick up and then hopefully the trend would emerge. And other people would pick up, well, it doesn't have to be circular either, it could be any kind of city system and that the efficiency of that system would become so attractive that others would want to do it. So in that sense, that's kind of what you're speaking of. You could have advanced scientists design these things, but again, the amount not of money... Like, not like super uh, circular cities, but something ordinary and... and uh, well, there are plenty, like Oroville, there are plenty of communities out there, I wouldn't call them necessarily communes, but communities that operate with their own infrastructure and their own very different way of living uh, that already exists, if you're not familiar with those. Yeah, there are a lot of those out there, but they, you know, if you, if I, say, I say it's great. I don't put it down, but I don't see it as a solution. Unless it's exemplifying the technology to show the world what's possible, you're not, you're running in place. You're not really doing anything, you know? Thank you. Thank you. Ma? אני רוצה קודם. אוקיי. You outlined in your lecture um, a history, an ongoing history of basically the 99% being perpetually uh, lied to and being manipulated to make irrational uh, life choices that are destructive to them and not in their interest. Yes. And th well this, right. this reminded me very much of uh, the 18th, 19th century Enlightenment uh, movement. Um, and the lesson of the 20th century is that the Enlightenment movement failed and facing different economical and other crisis situations, uh, the majority of the 99% uh, went to support uh, various regimes of despotism and totalitarianism. And also my, my own experience as an activist is that when you tell someone he's being lied to and that uh, when he was fighting this war which 
uh, was the most intense uh, part phase in his life. He was j basically being uh, tricked. Um, I'm rejecting him. He's not likely to join my cause. And my question to you is, do you think in the 21st century um, the circumstances are different and that it is now possible to simply uh, present the facts or the rationality of uh, the vision of Zeitgeist and be able to uh, mobilize uh, a majority of uh, supporters? Well, I, I, can't, I can't say definitively that, that a yes or no, but what I do recognize are the patterns of cultural change. When you look back at the history of slavery, you look back at all of these powerful phenomena, which I'm sure back then people said, oh, we could never change this because they were so ingrained. Yet we do see amazing broad liberation. We, we came from you know, massive racial biases and, 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 and the like uh, to kind of a, a ba basic understanding of equality. Science has illuminated a lot of basic truths that were not available to us before. Really serious superstitious bias have more or less subsided to, you know, to a certain degree. There's still conflict. But in the broad scheme, if, you know, most, very few governments, for example, are still controlled by, by um, are there are theocratic, you know, there's a few lingering ones. There is change happening. There is change happening. The pattern of change is hard to diagnose. One thing I do think is that the equality notion is one of the most powerful. So we've gone again from, from, from racism and slavery uh, to the liberation of, of women's rights. And I think the next stage, this kind of, this liberation of society is class equalization. Classism is really racism in a different form. And I think that eventually the economic necessity, meeting the needs of the human population, will no longer seem like some affair that's a privilege to get your right to life, to have to work. It will become a, a, it will become a normal part of reality. You're born into this world. You're taken care of by the system that you contribute to that takes care of everybody. I think this logic will prevail because it seems natural to me. So to answer your question, I, I do have faith. I have no idea how long it would take. I, have, I mean, you look around, you bang your head against so much. I mean, as I, as I went along tirade about patriotism and nationalism, those things are still very prevalent and in, uh, in all that xenophobic and utterly you know, biased and separatist uh, and uh, horribly um, ignorant positions leading to massive amounts of atrocity on a daily basis, if you think about it. How do we overcome that? Slow process. Why I give talks like this? But it, it can accelerate. There's a, there's a study that was done, I can't remember what the percentage was, but it said that once a certain idea reaches a certain percentage of the population as an acceptance, it accelerates very rapidly. It's, it's a basic analysis. I can't remember what it was. I want to say it was made... Where is Macana? The tipping point? The tipping point? Was that, I don't remember it being called the tipping point. But. No, not the 100 monkey. That's, that's a little bit different. But this was actually a recent study that was done that analyzed social change and at, at any rate. All those factors combined, we see great change in the world. We've historic, historically seen great change. With the incredible increase of information technology and understanding of the world around us, understanding of what we can do, I think, as many people here know, how do we justify supporting wars with all the destructive power that could easily be turned around to take care of everybody? We all know that the Israeli-Palestinian conflict on an economic level doesn't have to exist. The land, there's plenty of land to go around for all the population that are here. There's plenty of resources that can be brought in to create equality amongst all the people. But it's this baggage that exists for whatever purpose on whatever level that holds it back. And I think eventually it will be overcome. But I can't answer that question. I don't know. I mean, I often joke that maybe we're not designed to, to move forward. <laughs> maybe we'll just be an evolutionary cul-de-sac. The big question is, are we as a civilization programmed, if you will, do we have enough intelligence and ability to adapt to create a truly sustainable society? That's the big question. Do we? Are we, are we able to do that? Are we compatible with true technical sustainability as a species? We can talk about it if we can do it. I think so. I think so. So thank you for your question. Sure. Hi. Hello. Um, I have a question about the world government. Mitnatel, פשוט יש שאלה מה אנשים גם צופים את זה בזה באינטרנט בזמן שאנחנו חושבים פה, ויש זה שיש שאלה. כן, מה שאלתי? Yeah, we have a question uh, from the guys, uh, from the guys here. Okay.
see it in your uh, progress with that knowledge and spreading it? As of now, nothing that I'm aware of. <laughs> nothing that I'm aware of. I think in, in, as, if, if you track the history of political dissonance, if you want to call it that, uh, there's a long process of categorization and analysis of such figures when they finally release, say, the, the huge CIA FBI records on Martin Luther King or John Lennon. I don't think about such things as far as I'm concerned. I, I don't care. And since the movement is seen in many ways as probably far too idealistic in its broad view, it's probably, it's probably looked upon with great cynicism by those that, look, that are investigating subversive groups or whatever, that I, I have a feeling that we can go really, really far before these guys really catch on. I don't care. I mean, go ahead. I mean, it doesn't, it doesn't change anything. It's like, what can you, this is, this, the difference with what the movement does is it's so broad and it doesn't have loyalties that, that are traditional of what people would define as terrorist or what people would define as sub, 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 subversive in, a, in, a, in a, all, the, all the definitions that you've seen historically. It transcends all of that. And I, I just, I, there's a great faith in that because it's so, it's so broad. It's epically, it's epically radical. <laughs> And I think uh, there's a certain safeguard with that, at least for the time being. So. Godspeed. Yeah, thanks. Well, it seems that uh, Elian sort of asked my question, but um, it, it, get, it gets me to another one. Um, it seems that the people in power right now, they have most of the resources now. And uh, even I, have, uh, as a part of the global movement of trying to change things, and create an alternative uh, situation, uh, we don't always have the, the means to do that. And we, we find ourselves struggling to, to, you know, do it, just sure. like you said it. And uh, I'm wondering how uh, this, the tight cut movement is uh, supporting the, the initiatives in, in part of the, parts of the world. Well, uh, with events like this, I mean, it really, I mean, edu knowledge is, is really knowledge is really power in, in the sense of, in the sense of what will facilitate this type of movement and its transition into something new. And it's only when everyone becomes as educated as I try to be, and that's by the way what defines a true democratic presence. By the way, people often talk about democracy and equality. If you're not willing to be educated, if you're not willing to take the time then you're by your own fault becoming, on, on all odds, subservient to somebody else. That's what the whole basis of, of, of the governance and subjugation of, of, of in feudalism is all about keeping them illiterate. So it's all about understanding, and that's how the, we can materialize this. But as far as real projects, as I mentioned earlier, like the Global Redesign Institute, uh, we have all these event days. I, I'm constantly trying to find ways, because I don't have any real monetary support, so I'm constantly trying to find ways that are community oriented, that don't cost anyone money, that can bring people together and have an effect. And there's, we'll probably end up inching into some type of general kind of protest action, but usually merging with others to try and bring more people into us. Never just the zeitgeist movement protest. That's not really what is gonna materialize this. It's gonna be, it's gonna be thinkers that materials, materialize this. And again, back to the Global Redesign Institute, imagine if you had you had a small group of technically oriented people with a firm grasp of this foundation in pockets in every single country in the world. And they're slowly beginning to work together and they slowly begin to create their own institution. And I've talked about this as what I call a parallel government system. And that's more or less in gesture because obviously they're not in governance of anything except their own ideas. But if they can present themselves in such a way to show how we could change and beat everything, create world peace, no one has to worry about the nonsense, no debt, and really get that information across to the rest of the masses, then I think the turning point is just a matter of time, especially given the failure of, of this system as it continues. Even if it, it takes money to get it done? Well, obviously you can't do anything without money. But it doesn't necessarily mean you have to go out there and be exploitative and, and raise money for, for erroneous purposes. I, I don't raise any money for the movement that's it's something that, that at this point I think would work against it. And we don't really have those type of projects that enable it. Uh, and I could go on a long treatment of how I operate like that. But I, I, the gesture of it is really to get people's energy and time and to get them to not want to have the value of being supported by money because that's, that's a critical value because we're so distorted by that. I mean, so many people I meet, they're like, well, I, I could work in the movement, but I need to make money, so they spend all their time making money, which I understand, 
but you've got to start to divide your life up, if, especially if you have kids. I mean, this, the, the future is in, in great, a great precarious state, and I just wish people could kind of see that and balance their life, not get too extreme. It also frightens me when I meet people that are way extreme with this, and they're way too gung-ho, and they think that, I met people when the Occupy movement blew, out, blew up uh, in a positive way, that they thought this was it. This was, this was the transition. They were so, they just, they were like, this is it, we're doing it. And they were, they, I was, well, whoa, back up. <laughs> we have, there's no plans. There's, uh, they have nothing to really contribute creatively. It's, it's a great angst expression. It, it worked very well on a certain level on that awareness. It still was global. But back to my point, I'm, it's up to all of us that are thinking about these ideas to work together in a way. That's what the, the, the movement tries to facilitate through all the events. So I, I'm hoping that other people will enlighten me as to what other new projects can help create this. Getting community. back to community and love, that's all we need. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. <clears throat> all right. Um, I'd like to ask a question for which, which I think I've been asking uh, myself for two years now okay. regarding the Zeitgeist Movement. And I used to be a Zeitgeist Movement activist. Um, this is how I started being an activist, this is how I woke up. And uh, in the beginning, it was all about how we could spread the ideas of the movement through the movement, through the movement's uh, logo, website, movie, etc. And, and ever since, I've, I've gone through a personal revolution where I started working as a network activist, trying to like, connect between people get, having great ideas. Mm -hmm. And I meet many times that people have a difficulty seeing themselves as activists outside of organizations. So how, and, and this is like a question not for a philosophical um, uh, answer, but like personally, how do you see your role in, in connecting people that, that make change on a spiritual level, on an ecological level, on like awareness level, together? Because I think the Zeitgeist Movement has a lot of power to move these kind of ideas into a role. So. Well, <laughs> sorry, I don't want to have to repeat myself because it's... It's very similar in its, in its questions, the two questions that were prior. Uh, let, me, let me ask you. I just want to hear your idea. What would, how would you answer your own question? I'm curious to know. All right, I'll tell you something. Because this is something I've been waiting for for a long time. Like, um, as I guess the addendum ends with solutions you could have, and mm -hmm. I think that uh, moving forward as well, right. to have a particular notion inside the movement that talks about connecting between organizations and talks about how ideas are unrelated to a particular organization. Right. And I feel that it's among the wisdom that comes through, but it's not particularly said. I would like to have, I don't know, because that, like, have you ever heard about Paul Hawken? Yeah. Yeah, and so this kind of idea, the way that spreading, the, 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 like basically the solution mm -hmm. that is about to save us, like as he says, the uh, immune system of the earth, right. is people waking up all over the earth, not just agents for this movement. And it's really important for me to hear that literally spoken. Right. Um, and, you know, that takes nothing away from all the work that's being done, and, and thank you, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, the, the institutional work of the movement is, and its uh, attempts to bridge communities with other institutions is, of course, important, but only to the effect that hopefully the other communities will, will really understand what we're talking about, because it's, it's unfortunate with all the activists that I meet that engage in other institutions, that identify with those institutions, which also becomes counterproductive, by the way, uh, they become too ingrained in what they're representing. I see that in the Zeitgeist movement as well. It's, it's almost a fallback. It's, it's bad to have too much identification with an associ a, a group association and an identity you know, brand. Mm -hmm. that, that's dangerous. I'd rather see people associate with just the train of thought. Yeah. So that, that's critical to me, but that's really advanced. People have a general tendency and they're reinforced to have labels and to want to block themselves in. They say, I'm a Republican, I'm a Democrat, or they say, you know, I, I'm of this religious faith, or I, I'm liberal. They, 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 they qualify, hence that's a flaw of our language too, but they qualify themselves, and that's inherently boxing, that whether they know it or not. Well, this is the most advanced movement for social change, basically, that I know, and I think we, are, uh, we can allow ourselves to talk about advanced ideas. But anyway, like, thank you very much. Sure, thank you. Uh, Avi? Avi? Okay. Yoel? Hi. Hi. I'm Yoel. <laughs> um, okay. 
My question is, uh, I live in Zdot Yam, which is a kibbutz, like you mentioned before, right. um, kind of uh, similar to what you see in the Venus Project, but without scientists and with <laughs> worse architecture and uh, right. worse architecture and worse interior design. <laughs> um, anyway, my question is, on a kibbutz, uh, one of the big problems is that uh, people don't really have a motivation to produce, to contribute, to create, because uh, there's no money being exchanged. Mm -hmm. um, and I've, I've heard in the movies you discuss this kind of issue a little bit, about right. what, what the motivation would be in such a, such a, a resource economy-based society. Right. And I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about what, what would be the motivation. I mean, if, it's not, if there's not a carrot and there's not a stick, what exactly... What is the motivation? Th those that describe circumstances to me where people are unmo unmotivated in this system, but yet they happen to exist in sort of a systems that are based on reciprocal trade and in a, in a, in a communal environment that's required to do that. And they often say that, well, these, these tendencies of creativity don't seem to persist. And I have to remind them that regardless of if you're in that environment, you still have all of the supporting features of the environment of the market system and all of its engines around you, which are definitely inhibiting. So if you're grown up in a general environment where you're witnessing all the wealth and everything else, and you're witnessing all the, the power of money, even if you're isolating yourself in a smaller group that isn't using money, you're still very much affected psychologically. To answer your question, I think it comes down to really how people are educated. <laughs> It really comes down to the way people are educated and the, the sense of freedom that they're given at the youngest age. All the people I've met that have a tremendous creative drive had a very, very different upbringing and a very, very different life experience than those that were more or less victims of, say, a, a lower middle class household or a poverty stricken household, were forced to work at a very young age. They had this instilled ethic that their right of existence and definition was based on their labor contribution in a very me mechanic, mechanical sense. And their, their family values will carry that forward as opposed to a lot of people I've met that had very creative, free environments. They, weren't, they didn't have heavy pressures, and they, they do amazing work in creative fields, not only creative in the sense of you know, typical art forms like music or something that would be considered recreational, but engineers that are constantly thinking about solutions and that are constantly, they get off on the idea of problem solving and things that we don't usually think about or that we think would be mundane to us if that have grown up. Because I grew up in a drudgery-based environment, too. I can see that sense in myself. I do so much without any pecuniary reaction, any monetary gain now, uh, which amazes me because I, I grew up in the exact same environment that instilled a motivation for money. And I changed. I do almost 90, 90% of the stuff I do now is no monetary gain and heavy monetary expense. So it comes down to the way people orient themselves. And I think the solution lies at the earliest form of education. And there could be ways of analyzing that, as I point out moving forward. I think that the drudgery of the labor system where you're submitting to a job that you don't particularly like, which is the majority, what does that say about your sense of self-worth? How does that motivate you any farther? If you're going to a job in your, your, your little dictatorship from nine to five, and you come out, what do you expect from people in this kind of like, oh, in this expression of angst and, and alcoholism and drug addiction and sitting there playing video games 40 hours a day when you're not working? If there's, a, if there's a laziness that's inherent to the system, I believe. And if, I, I, if you look at children, there's no inherent laziness. People have to be paid to do things that they like to do. So there's, that all, there's a big spectrum. It's not easy to answer because we're working within this sort of general cultural dynamic, so it's hard to see outside of it. We haven't been able to see those grand experiments commence yet, but we see the pockets of them. And I think creative drives are inherent to us. We, we do get up and move around without money. I, I will walk across the stage. I will wake up in the morning and stand up without money. And you can, extrapo you can extrapolate that to what it means to do anything and what the motivation really relies. Otherwise, if you really take that train of thought home, it would be like people would just literally never move if they didn't have fiscal support. A lot of support. people don't. Well, I know. <laughs> in a certain sense, they don't. But it's really a cultural neuroses. It's really a cultural neuroses. Because again, 99% of human history did not have money. 99% of human hunter-gatherers, they did lots of stuff, probably in a very powerful way, very, very enduring way, excuse me, that did not require that type of reward. Either. It might have been survival-based in a very straightforward way, but there's a lot of evidence to show that the sustenance of life was met quite quickly in those environments, given the ones that still exist today in very small pockets, and they have tremendous cultural little nuances and 
and contributions and subtle inventions that they deal with, like the Piaha in, in, in uh, Amazon, in the Amazon, a few other examples that are still remnants. Unfortunately, most of them have been gone by a globalization and industrialization. But, so there, I think there are a great deal of examples that support, if the environment enables it, then people will be very creative and push forward without that need of that, that stick and carry. I also want to recommend a book called Drive, maybe you've heard of it, which is a book that was written by Daniel Pink that investigates what it means to be creative versus what it means to be mechanical. And what he found through a tremendous study, all sorts of research that was done in this, is that people are not monetarily driven in a creative sense, but they're monetarily driven when it comes to monotony. So if you're working on an assembly line at a restaurant, uh, yeah, you probably have to be paid for that because there's nothing rewarding. It's not creative. But if you are given a creative option, which whatever the field may be, people transcend that interest in money. They get obsessed with the creative venture. And it was found that those that engage in creative interests, actually, money actually had a negative effect on their behavior as opposed to a positive one. So there's a lot of stuff out there. Check it out. OK. Thank you. No. I was just before before asking, I have a big question, but I will not ask it uh, because I want to let uh, the other person ask which was before me. I want to, uh, I I feel really uncomfortable to say that because we're coming here to, to work together and I don't want to protest to get anything. Um, Please do. But, but yeah, I will. <laughs> um, it felt really uncomfortable for me that were, there were only men today speaking and only men, uh, yeah. I'm sorry, if, if you were, the one who were supposed to ask a question, I would not uh, steal the microphone from you. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I think I think for for movement to starting to uh, trying to build itself, um, it says a lot. I mean, the well, platform that, that we work on maybe be really problematic if women cannot feel comfortable to to speak here. Well, I don't. I don't. I don't. I, don't, I will not speak for you. I, I, I'm a man, but uh, yeah. Hello. I want to just say one thing. This whole event was produced by women. Thank you. Mostly by Adi Florentin sitting there. We, we didn't choose the speakers based on that. That's what that's. I understand. I understand the sort of political correctness in, that you speak of in general. In fact, I had someone accuse me. I, when I did my third film, I, um, I just went where the information was. It was, didn't matter who they were. And someone said, why are there only white people interviewed in your movie? <laughs> I mean, it, it really struck me. I was like, wait, what? And I mean, for, I mean it, was, it was ridiculous in its, in its general premise. But, but I, understand, I understand the rationale, because there are people in culture that have those, that baggage, that they, they have that, 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 that feeling of oppression that has happened for whatever purpose, whether, it was, whether it's female oppression, whether it's race oppression. And I understand that. And I try to be conscious of that ever since it's been brought up to me. But it doesn't mean when it comes to information that you, have, you should just make sure you have a woman there just for the sense of PR. I, I would love to see more, more women do a lot of different things with this yeah. respect to the movement. <laughs> well, well, if anyone here would like to, to speak, any woman here would like to speak, I'd love to hear it. Well, I'm going to have to apologize, but we really, sure. we really have, right. we really need to clear this uh, stadium in about five minutes. Oh. So we would love to stay and, and, and have like long Q&A for hours, but yeah. we simply can't. to ask you, uh, I saw that uh, in Zeitgeist there is a certain kind of uh, community that's going to happen, like 
peaceful and everything, but I, I didn't understand your question for what will happen if a bad uh, society or bad something will uh, try to take over of this good, peaceful community. Oh, the, the question I was asked earlier, you're right, I didn't answer that one, about what would happen if somebody tried to take over I want system? to make sure that I understand the question. Because okay, um, well, if you, if you look at what, if you have a, a system that's based on self-interest and based on kind of a cutthroat competition that we have today, as I, as I exemplified throughout this piece, how we have that competitive notion, that ruthless corporatism slowly had emerged, merged and manifested into the state entity as we have today, which is literally now a corporate institution, at least the empires are for the most part. Because it's more powerful. What's that? Because it's more powerful. Well, because that's what the system is. The system is based on a general imbalance that has to persist for the economy to unfold, meaning you can't have equality. Economies only work based on inefficiency, and this is a very large subject. Basically, the competitive model of economics demands that everyone's fighting amongst themselves. If you don't have a system based on that, if you have a system that's not based on reinforcing the need to always look after yourself, doesn't matter what happens to everybody else, then you, you will see a completely different state of behavior, what you would call egalitarian behavior, which because again... You're, because you are, they are a slave, so they need you alive. Maybe. <laughs> well, if you have a system that the, the structure is based on actually caring for the human population and the public recognize that, and there's no need, and there's no reward for corruption, there's a huge thing. There's so much reward in the system for people taking advantage of others that why should we expect anything less? If you demand, if you put into place a system that is based on the best public health and everyone knows it and they're educated enough, even if corruption did emerge, no one would tolerate it. Today, we tolerate every level of corruption. Why? Because we rationalize it and it's been with us for so long that we, we don't even really consider it that, that important in a certain sense. We, must accept, be not true. we accept this abuse because we, we also abuse others too. So there's a self-generating reinforcement that's constantly happening in a new system that doesn't have those values, that doesn't have any reward for, for the distortion of good values, if you will, good, then they won't materialize. Thank you. I want, want to say thank you uh, for Peter for making this. And I want to say thank, uh, thank you for everybody that made this uh, to come for real and I want to invite everybody that helped to make it uh, into reality to come to the stage so people can meet meet all of you Doreen, the, the translator come here come here Moshe everybody just go come <laughs> well, how you did that it's amazing. <laughs>